Hi there, SEC. I'm going to invite you to bow and pray, and uh, then we're going to open up God's Word. Father in heaven, it is good to come to your presence knowing that we're your children, knowing that you've adopted us, that you've called us your own, that you love us like a good father does. And, and today we find comfort, we find solace in that truth. As we recognize your goodness, as we recognize your grace, we see that, that in that you have a plan, and it's a good plan for the whole world. It's, it's a plan to bring your kingdom and to do your will here on earth, which is to share your glory over the whole earth. And so we would pray your kingdom come, your will be done. In the meantime, Lord, would you continue to give us what we need, our daily needs? Would you give us energy and strength and health? Would you give us protection would you give us provision of food and shelter? And Lord, might you give us the self-control to live according to our daily needs, resisting the temptation to hoard more, to use more, and instead rest in the goodness that is expressed in your, your willingness to meet all of our needs. And Lord, we rest in your forgiveness this morning knowing that we're loved, but also knowing that that love had a great cost and it was Jesus' death in order that we might be forgiven. Continue to make us aware of our own sinfulness so that we might, we might reject sin and live, live in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And, and with that in mind, give us the strength and the encouragement to forgive others as well. Those who have hurt us, those who have betrayed us, those who have ignored us, those who have forgotten us. And Lord, might we offer the same mercy that you've shown to us in forgiving them. Make us aware of our temptations, Lord, on this day and throughout this next week, especially as we are in the midst of a, what appears to be a long winter and has been a long pandemic. And Lord, make us aware of our, each of our own unique uh, temptations that may cross our path, that we might resist them and run from them and run to you by them and deliver us from evil. Bind us in the truth protect us in righteousness, uh, ready us in the gospel, guard us with salvation. Lord, shield us by faith and empower us in the spirit that we might, that we might find victory over the principalities and the powers that wage war over our souls. As we open your word today, might it speak light and might it speak life into our hearts. Might it encourage us to pursue you, to engage you, and ultimately to trust you in your name and for your glory, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and go to uh, Luke chapter 22 and also Hebrews chapter 5, and we're just uh, going to look at, at a very famous story, a significant story, and an important story uh, that is all centered around Jesus' prayer life. As you're doing that, um, uh, we are right in the middle of January, and it's uh, that coldest time of the year, the darkest time of the year, and, and dare I say it's maybe the most monotonous time, not just of the year, but, but maybe in our whole lives. Kirsten and I were talking the other day about, about how with the pandemic restrictions that are about, it's become very, very difficult to find life to add to our lives not having the social interaction, not having the activities that we're normally used to this time of year. Um, we know our family has fallen into a bit of a, uh, a tricky routine and it doesn't appear like that's going to let up any, anytime soon. Um, COVID has affected our church. Uh, just this week, we found out that one of our families has been diagnosed and are now um, uh, trying to get better from it. Uh, that's hard because it's barely come to Salmon Arm and yet it's still on its way and, and we've been dealing with the effects, the global effects, for 10 months already. Maybe it's caused you to take a step back and ask some of those questions that we asked at the beginning. What's God's purpose with this whole thing? What's God's will for this whole thing? God's purpose in Scripture never changes. His purpose is to bring his glory here on earth, and he does that by blessing his people and multiplying them and spreading them out over the whole earth. That is God's purpose and will be his purpose for all of eternity, even on the day when he, Jesus returns and establishes the kingdom here on earth and the whole earth will be full of his glory. His purpose will be fulfilled, but it will remain his purpose. In the meantime, all of us have to, to wrestle with what's God's will. Have you done that? 
recently? Have you wondered what's God got me in this for? What's his purpose for me personally? What's his will for me to do with this t- in this time? I'm convinced that God's will for his people, for Christians during COVID, is to be patient and persevere. Because God's people have always been called to be a patient people. Patience and perseverance means doing the right thing regardless of what circumstances we find ourselves in. It means, it means living by faith, pursuing holiness without immediately seeing the payoff. And perseverance is when we endure our life circumstances with hope. Christians are a persevering people because they are a hopeful people. And we find our roots in Abraham And he waited 25 years for the promise of God to be fulfilled. The Israelites, they waited generations for freedom from from Egypt and 40 years to enter the promised land. And the church has been waiting and praying for almost 2,000 years for Christ to return. You see, it takes patience and perseverance to live out the will of God. And that patience and perseverance is so very important because we are being inundated with temptation. This might be the biggest struggle in your whole lives as we live out this monotony, as we adjust and adapt to a changing world, temptation is strong. We're faced with the temptation to rebel against our government leaders. We're faced with the temptation to medicate ourselves with food and with alcohol and maybe pornography. We're faced with the temptation to express anger at those closest to us Some people have the temptation to blow up their marriages or just leave their families altogether. There's the temptation to allow laziness into our spiritual walk to take hold. Since we're not living out the normal rhythms, we're not being challenged to grow in our faith, it would be easy to just take a step back and ride this thing out instead of pursuing God in prayer and in study of his word and in personal worship. Pursue God's will is going to take patience and perseverance. You may say, okay, how do you know this is God's will? Well, it's kind of clear in Scripture, and, and it's, it's very much um, something that, that we're all wrestling with together. Sometimes God's will is revealed in prayer, and I would encourage you to go to prayer and ask God, what does he want you to do in this time and in this season? But more often, it is revealed in Scripture. It's in Scripture that we know his purpose is unchangeable, We know that his will is to accomplish his purpose in all things. And so so prayer can, can give us, at times, a very, very specific direction to understanding God's will for our own lives. But I want to say this today, that that prayer may be a way to discover God's will, but it is secondary to Scripture. See, the power of prayer is not in discovering God's will, but actually in obeying God's will. Prayer is more about what we receive to submit to his direction for our lives than to discover it. Scripture is clear on what God's will is, on what God's purpose is. Our tension is obeying it, is submitting, and is surrendering to it. Jesus is our example in this. In the passage we're going to read today, we're going to see Christ in prayer, but he's not discovering God's will. He's known God's will since the foundation of the earth. He knows why he had come. He's not discovering God's will, but he certainly is struggling with God's will. So much so that the stress of obedience caused blood to drip from his pores. Something people who pray know, they know this. Now prayer is hard. It's unnatural for the body, dare I say actually the flesh, to pray. Think about it. It requires time. It requires focus. It requires faith. It may require imaginations. And our bodies, our bodies are much more naturally drawn to activity, entertainment, and stimulation. But prayer is not a response to external stimuli, but rather it is a movement of the inner life towards God and conformity to his purpose and his will. 
Which brings us to today's passage. And as I mentioned, it's a famous passage. It's an important passage. And to know the gospel is to know the story of the last hours of Christ's life and find in them some sort of comfort in Christ's example and in his victory. We want to know what went on in Christ, in his heart. We want to know what went on around Christ in leading towards his death. And we want to know what happens through Christ in the power of his sacrifice on our behalf. This story today where we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and struggling with obedience shows us that the power of prayer is that it leads us to surrender. It does lead us to submission. It does lead us to obedience to the will of God. And that's how we resist temptation. Jesus comes to prayer. He comes as a son. And what we see is that God ministers him ministers to him, and then he leaves that prayer by faith, consenting to do the will of God. Now, sometimes God acts miraculously in prayer. I don't want to discount that. Sometimes God may change and adjust where he wants to take you in your life. But God in this story doesn't act like Christ wants him to. Here we have the Son of God, the incarnate one, the heir of all things, the one who God the Father made the universe through, and God doesn't rescue him. That may happen at times in prayer, but the pattern that we see more often is that when God reveals his will, it's in prayer that he strengthens his people to do his will. So here's the summary. Prayer is all about leading us to obedience to God's will. In this passage, Jesus is asking for God's will to be changed and God hears him. This is clear. In Hebrews chapter 5, and you can go there even right now, verse 7, and we're going to come back and look at verse 8 in a little while. It says this, In his earthly life, Jesus offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears, and he was heard because of his reverence. See, it was Jesus in humility, bringing his whole self before God. That he was given this incredible blessing, which was what? That God heard him. God doesn't change his will. God doesn't bring a sense of, of redirection, even though he brings momentary relief. But what Christ receives in that moment is a deeper faith, a deeper trust, and consents to the plan of God. So here's what I want to do. I want us to look at the power of prayer in Christ's life, moving scene by scene through this story. And Luke is describing the events without editorializing them. And I want you to see what's happening here, happening in, the, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this scene. Most specifically this, that Jesus is the model prayer and this is the model prayer. Let's read it together. Luke chapter 22, I'm going to read in verse 39 down through 46. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew with them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. May God be honored with the reading of his word. Remember, Jesus has been trying to prepare his disciples for everything to change. He knows they're going to be tempted. He knows that they're going to be attacked by Satan. He knows that they will no longer have the goodwill of the people, but they will be guilty by association with him. He knows that most of them will abandon him or deny knowing him. And so he takes his disciples after reminding them, as we saw last week, of the power of the scripture to be an encouragement to their soul. He takes them to pray. And this was their custom. It was to go pray in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. It's an olive grove, basically, Uh, Trees scattered all over, rocky ground on the side of a cliff. But that was where they found their, their place to find refuge and to pray together. 
It begs the question, why did Jesus pray? If Jesus knew the will of God, if Jesus uh, understood the whole purpose and plan of God, if he was God, why did he need to pray? Well, I've kind of already alluded to it, but I think it's important to come back to this, that Jesus prayed because he was in the flesh. To be in the flesh means that we're separated from God. That our flesh, our flesh apart from him, is sinful and and will withdraw from him. Now, Jesus wasn't full of any sin, but, but had the power of the Spirit working out in his flesh to draw him into communion with God. But, but the flesh was still at work. The temptations of the flesh were still within tension, with, brought this tension with God's will. So Jesus prayed because in prayer you receive what you need to obey God's will. Regardless of how it feels in the flesh. And this was his custom. He knew that he had to be habitually in prayer. To take times for that. Elsewhere we read that he often went to a solitary place early in the morning where he prayed. To be restored, to be renewed, to be encouraged, and to be strengthened. This was the custom. They always went to the Mount of Olives. It also tells us something else about going to this place. That that Jesus wasn't hiding from what was coming to him. He knew that Judas, his betrayer, would be able to find him and find him very easily. And we're going to see that story next week. But Jesus, knowing what's coming, doesn't run and hide. He doesn't take off. He doesn't flee the scene. No, he actually goes to the place where it would be predictable that he would be at. The disciples followed him there. And it would be the last time they'd follow him in a literal sense. Uh, From here on out, they would show us that you can still follow Christ by way of your spirit, your inner life pursuing him. But, But this would be the last time that they would follow him in a physical sense. And that's important because what he gives them, what he gives them is the example and the encouragement to continue to pursue him in their discipleship. So, Jesus, as his custom, went to the Mount of Olives where he prayed. He never assumed communion with God. It was an intentional action. And he did it because he was aware of his flesh. And so he says to his disciples, pray that you don't enter temptation. Jesus tells them, don't pray so that you won't fall into temptation. See what's about to happen. Project what's going on in your life so that you can submit and obey the will of God. So that you won't fall into sin. Jesus gives them this encouragement because he's facing the same encouragement. He's praying so that he won't enter into temptation. He knows what's before him. He knows the suffering that's about to come his way. And he knows his weakness. But he goes to God. This is what prayer demands. It demands an honesty. When we see in the Lord's Prayer that little phrase, lead us not into temptation, God is giving us a gift in those words. Jesus is giving us a direction to take time within our day to look and to say, what are the temptations that are going to come across my plate today? What are the things I'm going to face today that are going to be a crisis of faith? What are the temptations of the flesh that I'm going to be confronted with? When you're praying the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of the day and looking ahead, you are doing so with self-awareness. And self-awareness really is humility when we recognize that we need God's help to overcome that temptation. Lead me not into temptation is a prayer of self-understanding for seeing where that temptation may come and depending on spiritual resources. As Jesus says that to the disciples, pray that you won't enter into salvation. He then goes and withdraws from them. They're not praying as a group this time. Instead, he kneels down and he prays. That's what the passage says. His prayer is private. He's by himself. He's wrestling with what God has for him. The others, he's called them to do the same. Each of them has the same access to the Father. It's private. It's reverent. Jesus is is kneeling down. Even though he's God and he has all the rights of the Godhead, he bows and he's humble and he's reverent. That's what we read in in Hebrews 5, right? God heard him because of his reverence, because of this kneeling. And, And finally, it appears that it's very vulnerable, right? Jesus is bowed, his head to the ground, likely in a in a prostate 
position, maybe even laying on his face or just with his knees curled under him and his face on the ground. This is not the type of posture you have when you're on the lookout. When you're feeling threatened by by outside attackers. None of these guys are standing watch. Sometimes in our lives, we're so caught up in watching for the threats that are out there and trying to figure out what we're going to do in order to fight those threats that we don't take the time to pray. Yes, kneeling with your eyes closed is a very, very vulnerable position, but it is also the position where we know for sure that God hears us. Not in the physical sense, but in what the physical posture represents, which is that humility, that reverence. And that's the promise that God will hear. And he heard Christ. What did he hear Christ say? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is a perfect prayer. Not unlike the Lord's prayer, which is, which is one of those prayers that gives direction to our life. This is often the prayer that, that we should be praying in the midst of crisis. The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a pattern of prayer for each and every day. This prayer is when we find ourselves in desperate straits, in desperate needs. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. He comes as the Son and appeals to the love of God, knowing that's his Father. Asking, pleading, begging him to bring some sort of redirection But something happens in that prayer. As he is in the presence of God, as he is speaking and listening to God, his will is conformed with God's will. That's the power of that one word, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's the word of surrender. That's the word of consent. Spurgeon says this about that word. To say nevertheless in prayer means this. Let it be as God wills, and God will will it that it shall be for your best. Be perfectly content to leave the restful of your prayer in his hands. Who knows when to give and how to give and what to give and what to withhold. So pleading earnestly, importunately, yet mingling with it humility and resignation, you shall prevail. Christ knew the suffering that was going to happen over the next day. He understood the pain that he was going to face. The physical pain, the emotional pain, the spiritual pain, all of that over the next 24 hours. He also knew that the plan of God meant resurrection. In saying nevertheless, in submitting his will, he's submitting to whatever God has for him through the crisis, believing that God will deliver him and resurrect him from the dead. God hears, God the Father, hears this prayer, hears the willingness and the submission in the Son's words and then ministers to him. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. The prayer is paused. An angel shows up. We aren't told what that ministry of strengthening looks like, but it's kind of a cool imagery, isn't it? The purpose of angels is this. All ministering spirits are sent to serve those who are going to inherit salvation. And Jesus was one who received the blessing of the angels coming and restoring him, strengthening him. God meets him. God answers him. God does not change his will, but God does give him what he would need in order to be strengthened in it. Jesus is the model prayer. And here he's praying the perfect prayer. And he shows us that the purpose of prayer is obedience to God's will. That even though he's asking for relief, God does minister to him, but in a, in a way that would give him strength to obey, strength to persevere, strength and faith to live out what God's will was. Yet it's telling that even with the ministry of the angel, he still struggled. His flesh and spirit were in combat with each other. That he's, he's submitted in the, in the spirit. His flesh is still struggling with the implications, which is why in verse 44, we see this famous scene unfold. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus has prayed. He's prayed a good prayer. 
He's taken the time to seek out the Father. He's, he's embraced reverence and vulnerability. And God has ministered to him with a freaking angel. And yet, he still struggles. He's in agony. He's being tortured. There is sweat coming out of his pores, dropping on the ground like blood, which shows us this, that even the ministry of God in a supernatural sense doesn't necessarily always resolve the tension that we find inside of us from prayer. So what does he do? He prayed more. Being in agony, sweating drops of blood, finding this tension between soul and spirit, he pushed into prayer. He prayed more earnestly. He sought out God's power and his strength and his goodness and his kindness and the faith that only God can give by seeking out God more. Sometimes we pray, we leave our petitions with God and think we're just supposed to live our lives. We, we wrestle with attention. We wonder if we're doing the right thing or not. We never move on from prayer. After we place those petitions with God, we need to seek him out even more earnestly, especially in those times of agony. And then though, then he rises from prayer and he comes to the disciples and he finds them sleeping. Why? Because they were sorrowful. Their grief and stress had had a different effect on their bodies. Where the grief and the stress that was coming Jesus' way, the tension within his soul and within spirit played out in him sweating this blood. The disciples, they just gave themselves over to the flesh. They fell asleep. I think we all know what that's like, right? When we're faced with troubling times, when, when fear has taken a toll on us, and all we want to do is go to sleep. All we want to do is rest and close our eyes and forget or escape what is coming our way. All we want to do is feed the flesh instead of run to God, to medicate, to escape to find whatever kind of stimuli or just falling asleep altogether just to get away from the stress. And Jesus says to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The temptation that we're all facing, even within our flesh in these times where, where it appears that God is asking us to be patient and to persevere. The temptation is to give ourselves over to the flesh. The disciples would do that when under threat of their allegiance to Christ costing their life, they would deny him. They would abandon him. They would run. They would leave and do all of that in the flesh because they weren't prepared the same way Christ was from prayer. At the same time, we do see victory for Jesus that Jesus' will, the Father's will, will are in conflict, that that struggle in the flesh was taking place. And this should be an encouragement to all of us, that just because Jesus was the perfect human, it didn't mean that he didn't struggle with obedience to God's will. We see within him something that we all, all of us who have sought out the will of God and struggled to obey it, feel. The war between flesh and spirit his spirit wanted to do God's will. His flesh resisted, resisted it. But he prayed so that he wouldn't give himself over to the flesh. Many want to know what God's will is for their lives. It's never an easy thing. God's calling, God's direction, God's movement towards his specific will for you will always cost something. It'll cost reputation. It might cost comforts. It might, it will certainly cost convenience. Many people want to know what God's will is. And God's will is clear. He wants to spread his glory over the whole earth through his people living out the commission to go into all the, go into all the whole world and make disciples. But there's always going to be a choice for us we're going to have to consent or not consent. If our spirit has been moved by the gospel and we've been changed, our, our desire will be for God's will, but we'll still be at war with the flesh, which is why we need to pray. 
This is what happened for Jesus. This is how he learned obedience and showed us that he does understand the tension that's inside of us. Hebrews 5.8 says that although he was the son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. We often learn obedience through failure. When we give over ourselves to temptation, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. And it's crazy, right? The perfect son of God lived a life in the flesh by faith so that he could relate and have sympathy with us in order that he might pray for us even when we're not praying to him. The book of Hebrews tells us that. The greatest battle, though, in all of this is the flesh. Prayer always costs our flesh something. It always requires us requires some sort of submission. Sure, it costs sleep, right? Might need to get up a little earlier. It might set aside time in our day to pray. Even giving up a meal and fasting in order to pray. Sometimes that's what prayer costs our flesh, that focus. But the results of prayer often, often cost our flesh so much more the flesh can no longer have control of our lives. If we're aware of temptation and how we give ourselves over to it, and we won't be able to feed the flesh. We won't be able to give it what it wants. And it will wage war against our souls. But maybe that's the whole point. There have been many times in my life where I felt this tension, not to the degree of sweating blood or denying Christ, that said, I regularly find myself wrestling with God and with his will and having this painful tension inside of me, this desire to want to please him but not obey him. And it feels like war. And it happens when I find myself in a difficult situation in a relationship, whether it be in my marriage or people in my ministry or friends. It happens when I'm facing a painful consequence of my sin, when shame and stupidity just cause me to want to run from God instead of running to him. It happens when a bill is due that, that I wonder how it will be paid and I have this anxiousness and this doubtfulness that God will provide. It happens on the rare occasion when I fear for my survival, getting sick or having a strange diagnosis. And it takes its toll on my flesh. It, for me, it's sleeplessness. It's waking up at 2 a.m., panicked, sweating, wondering how I'm going to get myself out of whatever situation I found myself in. It looks like isolation, withdrawing from people I love, even into my own head, closing off the relationships that are close to me. It looks like escape, that is, choosing entertainment, indulgence, and all of that sensory stimuli over seeking God. But I can't escape it. Each time this has happened, it has felt like this, this war, this, this great struggle deep inside of me. There have been times where God's shown up miraculously. And I thank him for that. There's been more times where he's sustained me in doing the right things. Or forgiven me when I'm feeling guilty and ashamed. Every time, the war between God's will and my flesh is painful. Each time it felt like I was dying. And I'm not being dramatic. See, when we find ourselves in the tension between our flesh and God's will, submission always makes it feel like a part of you is dying. But it's a part of you that needs to die in order that you might live. When I see that the parts of me that are died are my, my tendency to to hate myself after my sin or my tendency to make life difficult for the people I love or my tendency to make ministry all about me or my tendency to give myself over to indulgences and I hate those things and, and I find myself within those tension when I finally submit them to Christ and to his will and choose to obey, that's when victory comes. See, that's almost the point. When we cry out to God in prayer, when we do so, the flesh will sound like a death rattle. 
because the flesh can only produce anything but death. But God's will wins out. And when that happens, we're given new life. We're given resurrection. Jesus embraced the plan of God for him specifically, even though it required death in the flesh, in order that he might rise and be resurrected by the Spirit in order that you and I might have that same kind of hope. Because when we place our faith in him to do that, we know this, that the power of the flesh no longer has full control over our lives and that whatever it costs our flesh in order to do the will of God will only lead to resurrection. And we experience that resurrection in our sanctification as we have victory over the flesh. And ultimately, not just in our sanctification, but ultimately in our salvation. When we rise from the dead and are in heaven with Jesus for all of eternity. This is the point. We weaken our flesh in prayer by the will of God, which is accomplished on our behalf, and when you experience that, you experience one of the greatest victories any Christian can experience. It, And this is what happens in Gethsemane. The power of the Spirit is diminished in Christ's life, and he obeys the will of God for him. He leaves there triumphing over his flesh. He leaves there in the Spirit, knowing that what he is about to face will not defeat him completely. He leaves there with his flesh defeated and his spirit trusting God. This is so important for us because here's the thing. None of us will pray perfectly. None of us will live out the effects of what prayer guides us to. We need to see in Christ an example of this. But even as we fall short of praying the same way he prayed, and fulfilling the will of God, obeying the will of God that he, in the way that he did with full submission and full surrender, that even though that's our example, the only victory we have is in him. I read to you a verse last week that said Jesus is always interceding for you and for me. Prayer reminds us of that. That Jesus is praying for us. That the power of our prayer is not what we're offering to God. It's what Jesus is offering to God on our behalf. That the spirit might be released and we might be ministered to in order that we might have the strength to follow God's will. His obedience led us to a new reality and relationship with God. When on the cross, he was rejected by God so you and I could be adopted, approved, and affirmed. What are the implications of this? Three things as I close. First of all, in prayer, we can be completely honest with God where we're at. In fact, this is imperative. If you can't be honest with God, you won't go to him. If you can't be emotionally raw with God, you will just use platitudes. You'll just create a relationship that is more transactional than it is intimate. Second, we must stay in prayer beyond our petitions. God wants us to give our petitions. If it be your will, remove this cup from me. That he might minister to our spirit in those moments. But in the agony and in the tension, he wants you to stay. Stay beyond just praying the words, but being in his presence, and being reminded us that he is good, that he is great, that he is gracious, and that he is glorious. And third, in prayer, we're given what we need to follow God's will, but we still must consent. It is still the decision to get up and go from that place, obeying what Christ has accomplished for us in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, would you be so kind as to just move in our hearts even now to give us comfort in the midst of our agony. You're asking us to be patient and persevere as as the world we live in is changing quickly and that our lives are totally different than they were a year ago. We're faced with new fears. We're faced with new temptations. Oh, God, would you strengthen the spirits of Shushua Community Church by your Holy Spirit that we might flee from temptation that we might understand the lies that we have a tendency to believe. Lord, in order that, in order that we might accomplish your will, bring your glory 
Lord Jesus, to all corners of the shoe swap. Bring healing and bring salvation and use us to do that, to speak words of encouragement, words of hope, and words of your salvation that all might hear of your compassion and of your grace. In your name and for your glory, I pray. Amen.